we do about politics in our world. I mean, we have it going on everywhere we go, and we need a discerning voice to help us find some degree of normalcy as we're trying to wade through the cultural chaos in which we find ourselves. That's why we have today's guest on the show, N.T. Wright. Now, N.T. grew up in northeast of England and studied classics and theology at Oxford, where he was ordained in 1975 and took his doctorate on St. Paul in 1981. Having served as a college chaplain and taught New Testament in both Oxford and Cambridge, he was assistant professor of New Testament at McGill University, Montreal from 1981 to 1986, and then was fellow, tutor, and I mean, there is so much into your bio. Chaplain of Worcester College, Oxford from 86 to 93, before becoming Dean of Litchfield, Dean of Litchfield, excuse me, in 1994, Canon of Westminster 2000, and Bishop of Durham in 2003. He is now the Senior Research Fellow at Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. Now, if you know anything about him, he's written a lot of books, over 90 books. And so today we're going to be talking on Apollos Watered about his newest book, Jesus and the Powers. So, Tom, welcome to Thank Apollos Watered. Thank you very Watered. much. Good to, good to be with you. Thank you. Are you ready for the Fast Five? <laughs> sure, yeah. Okay, here we go. Now, you travel all over the world, but what is, when you come to the United States, the food that you like the most? That's a hard one. Um, is it is it hard that it's not got any good food? <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I, I associate the United States with, with, with good food, but um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really stuck on that. Um, I, I actually, some of the best steak I've had has been in the United States. So I probably mm. better play it safe straight down the line and say, as long, as long as it's a really good steak, then I'll, I'll go with that. Well, that's a safe answer, but that's also a, probably a real answer for everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just a really good steak. All right. Number two, the contemporary person actually in the 20th century that has influenced you the most in your thinking. That's hard as well. Um, I, I, when before we came on the show, you mentioned Leslie Newbegin, and Leslie Newbegin was was very important for me at a particular juncture in my life, and uh, partly because of who he was as well as what he wrote and said, he had a presence about him which uh, w w he was quite quiet. He didn't have to raise his voice. It was just when you were with him, you had a sense that um, God was in charge and that everything was possible. And I've met other people who said the same. Oh, yes, Bishop Newbigin came here and he suggested we might try doing this. And, and, and we did. And that's been the foundation of everything we've done. I've had that story a few times mm. from people. And so I look back at, at uh, I was very privileged to know Leslie, um, uh, along with along with one or two other greats of that of that vintage, people like Professor Charles Mole of, of Cambridge and my own teacher, George Caird in Oxford. Um, and so I, I'm a combination of combination of influences, but Leslie stands out. He was unique. Mm. I love N Leslie Newbegin. You just made my heart swell because mm. he's one of my favorite and most uh, he's influenced the most to create this ministry to help Wonderful. people with a missionary encounter with Western culture. But let's get into your the next question here. OK, how about this one? One thing that puzzles you most about Americans is what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I am puzzled that despite so much um, uh, riches of education and the opportunities and the possibilities and the books that are published, et cetera, et cetera, um, how so many uh, in North American churches still seem to be, as I would see it, and I don't want to be rude about this, but still seem to be stuck in basically 19th century uh, dispensationalism um, brought up mm. to date with with um, interesting prophetic insights about um, which particular moment in the 1970s or 80s or 90s meant this particular figure in Revelation. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, trying to shift that is is extraordinarily difficult. And this is quite different. We don't we just don't have this phenomenon in Britain. In fact, the only places in the rest of the world where it exists are where American dispensationalist missionaries have gone and taught people to think like this, um, because happy people don't think like that just by reading the Bible. You know, you have to be have to be inducted into it. So that that's that's a real puzzle. How come? And and that makes me ask the question: What ideologies are being served by embracing mm. that? Now, th 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 that is something we could all be asked. I know, but I I would want to ask that. It's actually fascinating. I don't know if you've read Andrew Lynn's work, Saving the Protestant Ethic, which was done by Oxford, but he actually yeah. examines how contemporary or American eschatology has affected the economic system. Oh, yeah. And it's fascinating, really sure. fascinating. 
All right, number four. How about how about this question as we jump into this? How about uh, you've already talked about the the person who has influenced you the most, both most. But I do know that you're a musician. So if you could form a band now, what would you what would it be called and why? What would it be called? Yeah, what um, would it be called? What would you name your band? Okay, well, the, the the sort of band I would love to play in again would be a Dixieland jazz band. Um, that is, let's 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 go back to the twenties or thirties and uh, uh, just do all that stuff. So, um, the the, the Basin Street Brothers or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you Dixieland jazz? Yeah, sure. I'm, I I didn't know that was your musical. I didn't know that was your area. Uh, it isn't my area. It's one of several areas. It's one that whenever I used to, I haven't played Dixieland for a long time, but whenever I hear it, I think, oh yeah, that stuff is just so good. Um, uh, something about the, the the spontaneity and the fun of it. Um, I played a lot at school and, and, and college. I think the last time I played in a relatively serious band would have been about the early 1980s. But then we had kids and they took over and they're musicians and I didn't get didn't get a chance to to go on doing it. But maybe one day I'm I'm still not, I hope, too old to play a bit. But I mean, uh, I'm eclectic in my musical tastes. I, I you know, um, Shostakovich, Sibelius, Bob Dylan, um, Beatles, uh, <laughs> Bach, of course. You know, what's funny is we almost got Alice Cooper on this show. That uh -huh. would have been a very interesting conversation. We should have had oh. him on just with you. That would have been a fun conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, here's your last question. What is the one habit that your wife and kids always just roll their eyes whenever they think of you? Uh, probably my habit of um, escaping into the study and doing Zoom interviews with yet one more person. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. You kind of set yourself up. No, that's okay. I actually, Philip Jenkins said the same thing. He goes, my wife mm -hmm. says it's weird that I do these Zoom calls. Oh, really? Yeah, well, they <laughs> they they that's actually what he said. He's like what he said. All right, well, let's jump into your book. Sure. This is your newest book that uh, yeah. just came out, Jesus and the Powers. Actually, it's soon to be released as we're recording this. And of course, we all know what's going on politically right now. But what made you want to write this book when there are so many books out there talking about political witness in this age? Well, um, I think there's something quirky about Mike Bird, who's an Australian, and me as a Brit writing a book which is obviously partly aimed into the American situation. Um, I should say we're having an election sometime soon in Britain. Nobody knows when because in our system you have to have a parliamentary election every five years uh, at the at the outside. But it's up to the present prime minister to call it as the five year deadline comes up. So we know it's going to be at some point in the next year, but we don't know exactly when. But we have major political problems and issues in our country as well. And they get overshadowed by the question of Trump and Biden. Um, but they're, they're not insignificant because um, Britain still has a rather odd place both within and outside Europe. And Europe has a very contested place and role at the moment vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and the Baltic states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, it's actually a very dangerous time in world history. And we hope uh, that actually globally there are big issues. And I think one of the good things that Mike Bird, one of the many good things that Mike Bird brought to this book, because he knows more about it than I do, is an awareness of the political situation in, say, the South China Sea and the question of Taiwan and China's relationship with Australia and also the question of India. I mean, Indian politics, I've got a good friend who's a senior church leader in India who keeps me informed of this. There's some major developments going on there at the moment which are really worrying from a Christian point of view, from mm -hmm. a global political point of view, um, and from the fact that um, India seems to have an ambiguous relationship with Russia and sometimes a, a, a more positive one than most of us would wish they had, and so on and so on. So there are huge issues, never mind the migration crisis, which affects us as much in the UK as it does with people coming in, uh, up through Mexico in, in the United States. And we don't have answers to these things. So what Mike and I are hoping to do is to lay down some parameters for uh, not for who to vote for, but for how to start thinking wisely and Christianly about major political issues. And um, we're trying to avoid the knee-jerk reactions and to say, let's dig down and look at the biblical foundations of this and, and how it all plays out.
Okay, so you start off in your book, you talk on the thesis that the kingdom of God is not from this world, but is definitely for this world. So let's let's start there as we jump into this, because again, there's so many people that we talk about politics, and I've had a lot of conversations on this show, including with Albert Moeller. We had a lot of disagreements on political, uh, our involvement, as well as Pete Wainer, who writes for The Atlantic and The New York Times, and they, the as well as Russell Moore. We've all had these conversations. Everyone is advocating for the flourishing of, the, of, of society, but everyone has a different ideal. You start saying, no, let's start with the kingdom of God. Let's begin there. So what do you mean when you say that the kingdom of God is not from this world, which I think many of us get, but is definitely for this world? Well, I mean, this is a way of refuting the normal but wrong interpretation of what Jesus says to Pontius Pilate when Pontius Pilate says to him, so are you a king? And Jesus says well, various things, but he ends up then saying, um, my kingdom is not from this world. And that was translated in the King James Version as my kingdom is not of this world. And so generations were taught that Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom which exists up in heaven and which then basically leaves this world out of consideration. And this world is just a dirty place and you get more dirty by messing with it. <clears throat> so the sooner you can get out of here and get your soul in tune with God and then ultimately going to heaven, the better. And so this was a way of saying no to that view and saying instead what Jesus meant, certainly according to uh, John's Greek there, is my kingdom is not from this world. In other words, my kingdom does not grow within this world, but everything we know about Jesus and the kingdom from all four gospels is that the kingdom of God was supposed to be coming on earth as in heaven. In other words, it is for this world. Uh, one of the things that astonishes me is the number of Christians who pray that prayer day by day because they were taught by their mother or whatever, um, the Lord's Prayer, but don't realize what it is they're praying for, that God's kingdom would come on earth in this present reality. And then if you say, well, look out of the window, it obviously hasn't happened yet. The answer is, ah, you're looking for the wrong thing. And Jesus' redefinition of kingdom in Mark chapter 10 is absolutely vital here. I think I get to it in one of the chapters here in this book, um, where James and John want to sit at Jesus' right and his left in his coming kingdom. And Jesus says, you have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and then says, you know, are you able to suffer the same way I'm going to? And then he says, listen, the kings of this earth get their way by bullying and bossing people. We're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it the other way around. The one who wants to be great must be your servant, it must be the slave of all, because the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And it's fascinating because over against what both liberal teachers and conservative teachers have done, you get the atonement theology of Mark 10, 45, giving his life as a ransom for many, inside the redrawing of political theology, which is this is how the rulers of this age do it by being uh, demagogues or tyrants or whatever. And we're going to run the world a different way by being servants, by uh, going and giving of ourselves to people. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount's all about. You know, Blessed are the poor in spirit and the meek and the humble and the brokenhearted and the mourners and the hungry for justice people and the peacemakers. And they're the ones through whom God's kingdom has been coming and his will has been being done on earth as in heaven for the last 2,000 years. And so the question then is, how do we as Christians facilitate a society which has those sorts of priorities about putting the poor first, the weak first, um, peacemaking first, justice first, etc., rather than what the demagogues and the tyrants have done all along? So that, that that's the very short version. <laughs> You, it's interesting you mentioned that talking about the Sermon on the Mount. I remember reading in that book that I just alluded to about um, Andrew Lynn and saving the Protestant ethic, and he actually refers to C.I. Schofield, of course, the premillennial oh, yeah. dispensationalist, who actually said that the Sermon on the Mount was not for today, yeah, not yeah, at all, yeah, and just yeah. totally removes that from yeah. us. But we see that we are to advocate for that and, kingdom, and and that that's a that's a real problem with the whole dispensationalist movement. Um, that that you know that 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 dream has been postponed until either the Lord comes or the rapture or whichever system you happen to follow. Um, and that, that, it seems to me, is such a flagrant denial of the whole message of the New Testament that it's extraordinary that people who hold that sort of view um, could, could ever hold their heads up and say they're Bible-believing Christians because it's so absolutely antithetical. But anyway, you 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 know that world as much as I do. <laughs> well, I probably know it a little bit better. I went to a premillennial dispensationalist school oh, as I, an undergraduate. I, I, I'm so sorry. I hope you managed to take the right <laughs> antidote. You, you had a good doctor who gave you a medicine to take it. To get rid of it. 
I did. It, it took me a long time to, to learn to see the difference and then praying that with the Lord's prayer, seeing that that actually really changed my mind is seeing the scriptures, yeah. seeing it brought out. Yeah. But there's still yeah. a lot of confusion because it is the predominant theological system that is existence within America. And I yeah. find that there is so much confusion even now. But there is a, a sweat, a, 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 you know, there's a pendulum shift right now. Yeah. Go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, I was going to say uh, the, the problem with that is that it, it leaves a vacuum and into that vacuum can come all sorts of other ideas. Um, and the people who embrace that dispensationalist view have no real basis to critique the things which come into the vacuum because they've absented themselves. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're not playing on the field anymore. Um, and so then you get somebody like, um, your uh, former president and possibly about to be next president, who knows? Um, and a lot of those people are voting for him for reasons which I find disturbing and distressing in the extreme um, on the grounds that somehow they think he's going to preserve or protect um, some way of being an American Christian, um, whether it's on the abortion issue or whatever. And uh, that that is such a naive way to do political thought. Well, it's not even doing political thought. It's a, it's a way of abrogating political thought and and saying we're going to go with a knee-jerk reaction instead. And, that's, and then we're in very, very dangerous territory. And I mean, you know, I don't agree with the idea that America should be the world's policeman. But um, nevertheless, over the last 150 years, if America decides we're going to go and do something like helping Europe in the First World War and the Second World War, then sooner or later that weight is going to tell. Obviously, that didn't always work. Think of Vietnam, think of Afghanistan, etc. However, a sense that uh, we need America to be on side with liberal, democratic, freedom-loving uh, societies around the world. And if it's not going to play and hold up its end, then we're all in trouble. How then do you just suppose that you, you talk about the kingdom and the cross and yeah. those two that are twins that they need to go together and we need to understand it. But we also need to be understanding how we are to build the kingdom. Now, actually, no, excuse me. You said we don't build the kingdom. We build for the kingdom. Correct. So yeah. so really parse that out for us, because I, I thought that and I went, oh, no, I used to do this thing with church members where I would hand out hammers. And yeah. when they become members, I would say, you're helping build the kingdom. And now I'm like, I need to feel like I have yeah. to go back and take back the hammers because I didn't say it right. <laughs> well, if if you give them a sickle in the other hand then they'll be building a different kind of kingdom. Oh! <laughs> you're killing me tom <laughs> but the the thing is this paul in one of his letters talks about his fellow workers for the kingdom of god and when we see how Paul talks about the kingdom, he talks about it both as a present and as a future reality. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is already ruling the world. According to 1 Corinthians 15 and according to Matthew 28 and all over the place, the ascended Jesus is already Lord of the world. He doesn't have to wait for that. That's, that's the reality. But Paul then says he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So he is ruling the world. But at the moment, there is a battle going on in the heavenlies, as in Ephesians chapter 6, with for which Christians are recruited to be prayer warriors and putting on the helmet of salvation and all the rest of it, um, because until death itself is conquered, then the new creation, which is the ultimate kingdom of God, um, hasn't happened yet. So we're in between. The kingdom has been launched decisively. Jesus is in charge, but it's Jesus who's in charge, not some tin pot tyrant. And Jesus is the Jesus who gives his life as a ransom for many. So the way he is in charge through his spirit is through his followers, giving their lives to look after the world and to bring God's hope and justice and, and mercy to the world. It's you know, Christians who, who campaign to free slaves and, and that sort of thing, and, and plenty of other, other things besides. Um, so that's building for the kingdom, the point being that when God then does bring about God's kingdom finally and fully, what we do in the present will be seen to be little bits of anticipation of that, bits of God's future borrowed from the future, instantiated in the present as signposts to what's coming. So that's building for the kingdom. Um, I, I, do, do, if you know my book, Surprised by Hope, I use the example of a stonemason in a medieval cathedral um, workshop, and, and they're, they're building this great cathedral. But the image then is 
of the stonemason who's just been told, I want you to carve this bit of stone, um, put this little carve here, uh, this little curve here, uh, etc. And the stonemason probably doesn't have a very good picture in mind of what the whole cathedral is going to look like, just knows this is what's been given to him to do. But then when that bit of stone goes up on the wall of the west front of the cathedral and you stand back, you realize the tiny thing that I was doing that seemed so insignificant in the stonemason's yard is part of the much larger plan that the architect had in mind all along. So that's the sort of image that I have in mind when I talk about building for the kingdom in the present. You, in, in the book, you talk about the powers because you do mention yeah. that the church is to um, really speak against the powers. And what is, let's define the powers, first of all, because I know people have different ideas in their mind of what the powers actually are. What are the powers you're referring to? Ultimately, the dark power which Jesus refers to in Luke 23 when he says this is your hour, 22, when he says this is your hour and the power of darkness, there is a sense of darkness as opposed to light. Um, in other words, chaos as opposed to order. In other words, the destruction of God's good creation as opposed to its enhancement or flourishing. And sometimes that dark power is personalized and given the name of the Satan, which means the accuser. Um, and of course, there's a, a long history through scripture of the way in which the idea of the Satan and then of the devil comes to be spoken of. I prefer to think of that power as an it rather than as a he, because I think it's a kind of a subpersonal power, um, but it's, it is the power of the negativity, the power to destroy, to kill, um, to, to, to tear down anything that's beautiful or good. And um, that's the, the power that then gets its claws into us humans and seems to have a handle on much of the rest of the world to pr produce entropy and so on. But ultimately, it is opposed to the God of creation and new creation. So it's as though right now, and certainly when Jesus was announcing the kingdom and thereafter, um, the powers of darkness were trying to do their worst against him. Sometimes these powers are itemized in the plural, thrones, dominions, kingdoms, powers, authorities, etc. I think when Paul and the other writers list them like that, I don't think they have a precise definition for each one of those. I think this is a way of saying that when you give humans any kind of authority over bits of God's world or over other humans, you are giving them with that the standing temptation to abuse that position for their own good. Now, this is the trick because you can't say, well, let's do away with authorities because God wants his world to be wisely ordered under human governance. That's Genesis 1. It's Psalm 8. This is what bearing the image is all about, being God's representatives, bringing wise order into the world. But the minute that you step away from being God's representative to do this, you start doing it for your own benefit or for Caesar's benefit or for somebody else's. You see this most clearly in John 19, when Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, and this is Jesus talking to Pilate, for goodness sake, when Pilate says, don't you realize I have the authority to have you killed? Jesus says, you have no authority over me unless it was given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. In other words, even Jesus acknowledges that even Pilate has authority over him because that's how God wants the world to work. But the corollary is the bearers of authority have a responsibility. They will be held accountable to God. And so there's that to and fro the whole time. God wants his world to be wisely ordered, but God will hold those who are rulers in the world to account. So the rulers and authorities are the ones who do hold some kind of authority in God's world, but when they become, if you like, too big for their boots, when they forget that their whole vocation is to serve the people whom they're looking after and, and think that they must do it for themselves, then they become, as we might say, demonic. And, and Paul is quite clear, uh, like many Jews of his day were quite clear, that the big gods, Zeus, Aphrodite, Poseidon, whoever, they don't exist. But what do exist are these uh, nasty little demons, these dark forces that skitter around and have the, the, the authority of the Satan. They are aimed at destruction. They're aimed at destroying, pulling down things that are good in God's world and people who are good in God's world. So um, it, we are never given a definition of what these powers are, but they're superhuman and more than the sum total of human folly and sin. But 
um, ultimately they only exist because God called humans to be his servants in looking after his world and humans prefer to give their power away to certain forces within the world whether it's money or sex or power or whatever and then those forces say thank you very much now we're in charge and they start to carve things up so it's a messy situation my fear is that most Christians have never even thought around that loop but that little loop that I just described is absolutely basic to biblical theology this this is how things work and then the problem is that the dark powers are are sneaky they don't uh, come out in the open and say hello I am a dark power you better watch out um, you only discern them when bad things are happening and you can't quite figure out why and then you have to get together and pray deliver us from evil and so on and putting on the whole armor of God spiritual warfare is absolutely vital otherwise we just fool ourselves and imagine that the people who we elect to serve over us who then do their own pleasure that they're just silly human beings and, and the answer is they're not they could they can be manipulated by the powers though the powers like to stay off stage and out of sight and so it's just these humans who are taking the rap but we need to be discerning i could go on about this but i but i probably said enough no it, i i know that you've uh, talked about mike people have asked you about mike heiser and mike talking about the unseen realm and his work in, in regards to that you also mentioned though that the unseen realm and the physical realm overlap you mentioned that in the book the question is, is how do they overlap? How do we determine that difference? And when we speak truth to power, are we talking about it in the idea of we're taking a stand, speaking to the the, the spiritual powers, or is it we're speaking to these human agents that represent those spirit, spiritual powers? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I I, I haven't met Mike Heiser. I, I haven't actually read his books. I've been I skimmed one of them when a friend said you should read this. And if you look around my room, you'll see lots of books, half of which I've read and half of which I should have read. And that's, so it's just how life is. Um, but I, I would say when we're speaking truth to power, the first place to speak it to is to the actual human beings who are running the country or the committee or whatever it is, that we have to be able to have the discernment and then the courage and then the wisdom to speak truth to power. And that is a principal vocation of the church, I would say, from John 16, when the Spirit comes, the Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. How does the Spirit do that? By being in and through Jesus' followers, uh, speaking the truth to power. But then as we do that, sometimes human authorities will say, do you know, you're right. We were really messing that up. We need to take stock and, and peg back and, and do this differently. Other times they will start to make excuses and, and, and squeeze around the edge. And, and you realize something else is going on beyond simply human beings thinking things through. And when that happens, and in any case, you know, day by day, we should be praying, deliver us from evil. But when that happens particularly, we then have to say, which powers are being worshipped here? And chances are it's going to be, you know, Marx, Freud and Nietzsche, um, money, sex and power somewhere in the mix. Um, and those sometimes need to be smoked out and they need to be addressed that actually, if this is what's going on, um, we are calling you to recognize it and renounce it and find better ways forward. Um, power is important. Uh, you know, money, sex and power are important, but they're not all important. And when they, when one or more of them become all important, then we're all in deep trouble. How do we go about in doing that as Christians, knowing that we're going to experience we're going to experience persecution. We we know that that's inevitable. Just as Jesus talks about, we see that uh, Paul, you know, endure suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. How do we juxtapose that with this political idea? Because the gospel, as you've already mentioned, is a political thing. It it, it is. It it speaks into our our lives. Then you get others though that see that separation, and others, even still others, and you reference Kuiper in the book, who sees that transformation of them to see the sovereignty of God within it. Yet we have the James Davison Hunter concept where we're to be faithfully present within that. As Christians, we want the flourishing of society. We want to see Christ glorified. We know that we can't, that, that Constantinian temptation is there to, to force that, but we can't. We're in a pluralistic society yeah. in order for other people to, to bridge that gap. So how do we speak then to our people as their role, both individuals and as a collective, body to embody and be that signpost of the kingdom in the middle yeah. of a world that's never going to agree with them entirely and hold them in account 
Yeah, I, I I just finished doing a lecture course on the letter to the Ephesians, and the Ephesian letter is very much addressed to this. Where right from the beginning, the trouble is that in the in the Western medieval and then Reformation traditions, people have read Ephesians as being about how you get to heaven, and really it isn't. It's about uh, what God wants the church to be here. Yeah, um, and obviously uh, ultimate salvation is the horizon, but it's very much. Um, uh, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 3.10. And what is this church of which chapter 3, verse 10 speaks? And the answer is, it's the polychrome, polyglot, polyform church, the church composed of Jews and Gentiles, of men and women, of slaves and free, uh, um, uh, a church which uh, does what Caesar would have loved to have done, namely unite humans across traditional ethnic and social sociological boundaries. But Caesar's empire was never able to do that. And the church at its best, and Paul is struggling to say, this is your best, please go for it, will hold up the mirror to power when Caesar sees the church being the church, then, oh my goodness, there's nothing else quite like this. Uh, I remember once going on uh, a diocesan pilgrimage when I was Bishop of Durham. We went to Holy Island off the Northumberland coast, and we walked across the sands like the old pilgrims had done um, 1,500 or more, or more years. Um, I forget how many hundreds of years, but um, in the days of people like Cuthbert and Aidan. And uh, as we did that, there were some television cameras rolling, and a colleague pointed out, that look at the people who are here. We've got old ladies, we've got families with young kids, we've got middle class people, we've got sort of business business types, we've got all sorts of people. Where else would you find a cross section of society like this, all gladly engaged in the same thing, and then all coming together to worship the God in whose name they are called? And that was a, that was a, a, an indication to me. I have no idea how many people saw the news clip or whether that message got through to them. But that that's the point that the church, by being the church, sends out signals to the rest of the world that actually this is the way to do the whole human project. And uh, of course, that is why the church spread in the first centuries. Um, I was talking with somebody just the other day, and uh, the point came out very clearly. And it may be that Tom Holland says this in his book, Dominion, I just can't remember, but that when the early Christians talked about a God of love, a God who loves you, this is totally new. The average pagan had no thought that Zeus might one day say, I love you, or Athene might, or Poseidon might. They they didn't love human beings. Human, They manipulated them. They used them in their power games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if somebody said, well, we don't really believe you about <clears throat> this God you talk about, the answer is, look how we live together. We live as family. We are caring for one another. We are looking after one another. And, and we are doing that because in Jesus, the one we follow, the one by whom we are formed, we see this God of love, which is a God that you and your world had never dreamt of. And, and, and when people see that, that is enormously powerful. That's the John 17 argument. I pray they may be one well, as we are one so the world, of course, may, know the world may believe. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But it's, it's kind of, it's love with skin on. I was talking to one of our ordinance from Wycliffe Hall just yesterday, and she said she'd been working in a church in a very difficult, rough area of one of the British cities. And uh, she had a teenage girl who came into the church and sat down and said, I am safe here. And I thought, wow. First, I thought, I hope she really is. But then I thought, that is a way of saying, this church is a real church. This is a church where people who are bruised and broken and frightened and nervous about everything else that's going on in the world, they can come here and they know that they're going to be genuinely loved and looked after and held as family and not uh, let loose to the winds. It's interesting you mentioned that in the book that came out, it, it was specifically focused on North American Christianity called The Great Dechurching. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but in it, it talks about how in the last 25 years, 40 million people have stopped going to churches in the United States of America, 40 million. And and it's, I mean, there's a lot of different factors involved. The internet plays a part within it, politics. Some of it's just simply moving, just practical things. But what you're seeing is a continued decrease across the West. In the UK, you see it in Europe, you see it in Australia, we see it here. But do you think, this is just your personal opinion, is it because we have separated it and made it individual salvation without the understanding of a robust understanding of the church and its role that we've lost this greater witness to the world because we've individualized it to the point of removing it from the collective nature that the I, church has? I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it. Uh, to be sure, it's partly the whole Enlightenment critique 
um, w which has eaten into the very fabric of, of many people's awareness so that even if they still sometimes want to go to church and sing Christmas carols, say, because that reminds them of when they were kids, um, it doesn't it doesn't actually go too deep. Uh, it's still there. It's still a resource, but it often doesn't go too deep. But I, I think you're absolutely right. And this is where this is the danger of certain kinds of Western individualism that we want to say the gospel is for you that you know you can't think you're a christian just because your great aunt was a christian or whatever it's got to be you personally i've heard people preachers say god has no grandchildren you know you you need to, you need to know god as your father not just your parents father or whatever and there is of course great truth in that make for yourself make, make your own the faith into which you were born yeah. or baptized or whatever it is however that individualism then does produce, and I've seen this in some would-be evangelical contexts, the idea of church, which is just a sort of happy accident that this person's a Christian, that person's a Christian, that person's a Christian. So sometimes they all like to be in the same room saying their prayers or singing a hymn together because it's kind of fun, rather than seeing the witness of a community. Because you know, in the book of Revelation, the great scene is a great multitude that no one can number of all nations and kingdoms and tribes and tongues, unless there are moments when we're doing that, we're not actually being our true selves. We are diminished. And different cultures, non-Western cultures, have often got this right. You know, the African slogan, I am because we are, and so on. Um, and that can be overdone. And that can produce passive Christians who just slide along and hope it's all right. But we've we've got to re to recapture that sense of corporate identity. Well, I think that's where Andrew Walls came in, understanding just ah. the understanding of the the non majority or the majority world speaking to the non majority world. Because yeah. one of the thesis that we have is that as the Western Church begins to decline, we've seen cultural idolatries that have attached to yeah. Christianity, syncretizing it into something altogether else and removing it from the church. What we want is a missionary identity really yeah. or a missionary yeah. ecclesiology as the church and that's where i think what you're saying is it has to permeate within the political world because the gospel is political in its nature so in some respect we're not fighting the unbelieving world right now i mean we are but we're fighting bad theology is yes, what yes, we're fighting absolutely. Uh, bad absolutely. theology across the board and and I mean, it's it's very telling. I was reading a book recently, a, a very serious academic book on Christology, on what, what we say about Jesus, which um, goes into all the great medieval debates and Reformation debates about how you put the humanity together with the divinity, et cetera, et cetera. At a certain point reading that book, I thought, hang on, where's the kingdom of God in all of this? And I looked in the index and there was no mention of the kingdom, not as K kingdom, but not under Jesus' teaching either. And um, it's as though the whole, the only thing that matters is figuring out how Jesus can be both fully divine and fully human. As though if we get that right, then wow, we've 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 won. We're at the top of the tree. Um, instead of saying the whole point, uh, the, the the way I've said it in lectures is sometimes like this: that the idea of Jesus being divine and human that is the key in which the music is set, but it isn't the tune that's being played. In other words, I've used the image. Supposing the conductor comes onto stage, looks around at the audience and says, C minor. And the audience think, uh, um, yeah, we've got Beethoven 5 on our programs. We thought it was in C minor, so you're telling the truth, but we're waiting for you to go da-da-da-da. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's one thing to say, I as a theologian have constructed this lovely picture of how we can say Jesus is divine and human. But unless you're prepared to say, the kingdom of God is breaking in, has broken in in Jesus, is coming at his return, and we are agents of it right here and now. Then the heart of the thing, the main music is not being heard or played. We had we had Kevin Van Hooser on the show and we were talking oh, yeah. about it as a divine drama, really, the yep. divine drama of redemption and our play in it. It's not just a propositional script where sure. you discern these truths. But we also had Dan Strange on, and he mentioned in the first millennium how they're debating on the the deity of Jesus, fully God, fully man. Second one, the second millennium, nature of salvation. Third millennium is what does it mean to be human in the middle of the world? And I think that's a pretty telling idea to see that. And I think your work actually is hand in glove for that. It yeah. just fits that idea, which is something the scriptures already talk, talked about. Why do you think, though, we've lost this? I mean, is it because of the bad theology that's there? How have we yeah. just moored away from this so, think, so completely? I think a lot of it, and, you know, I, I don't join in the anti-Augustine um, uh, uh, chorus which goes on. I have a lot of respect for Augustine, even where I, I think he did lead us astray in some ways. But the concentration on sin then 
filtered through the long Middle Ages comes out as this is the first thing we say about human beings. Indeed, it's the first thing we say about Genesis. You know, God creates this lovely garden and he sets humans an exam which they fail. And, and that's not what's going on in Genesis 1 and 2. It isn't, here's an exam, and if you pass this, you get to go to heaven. And if you don't, I'm sorry, you're going to hell. And so many Christians have been taught theology that way. Um, what it is, is here are these humans who are the image bearers within God's temple. And as you will know this stuff, I hope, that creation is the construction of a, of a temple, a heaven plus earth reality with an image at its heart. That is a temple in the ancient world. The humans are given this amazing vocation to reflect God into the world and reflect the praises of the world back to God. Before we mention sin, we've got to celebrate that vocation, which is celebrated in, for instance, Psalm 8. Uh, um, in other words, the fall hasn't ruined that vocation. And in Colossians 3, Paul says that we are now in Christ to be renewed in knowledge according to the image. In other words, getting back to the image is where we're aiming at. And in the book of Revelation, we are to be the royal priesthood. That's the same thing, sharing God's rule over the world, sharing the praises of the world to bring them back to God. Now, when you see that that's what being human is all about, then you realize that the problem with sin is not, oh dear, I've done some wrong things, so God's got a big stick and he's going to punish me, but that, oh dear, I've messed up, I've worshipped idols, and therefore the bit of God's ongoing creational purposes, which I ought to be an agent of, ain't happening right now. And I need to be rescued, not just so that my soul can go to heaven, which is something the Bible never says, but so that I will be part of God's putting right purposes for his world. And that is a whole different take on what it means to be human, what it ought to mean to be human. And, and when we get that right, yes, well, roll on the third millennium, if that's what we're going to be talking about. But that, that, that's, that positive line, and, and th this isn't to say that sin doesn't matter. It's when you see this, you realize just how much sin matters, because it's not just messing up me personally or others around me. It's messing up God's purposes for his whole creation. Well, that's why we have Romans 8, where it says that the, the creation groans for the sons of God to be revealed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and then you, that but was, you, that was you, my, that was my uh, last book, which you didn't, which you didn't interview me on. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you. You probably, you probably seen this book, have you? I have. I haven't yeah. got it yet, but I'll, I'll do that, and then we'll do an episode on that one, just for fun, just for fun. Okay. Okay. And just to annoy your wife even further. Okay. <laughs> but going back, you mentioned the fact that they were considered to do their vocation, and yet when when Adam falls, all of creation falls with it. I yeah. I think sometimes we fail to mention that. Part of it. We do talk Absolutely. about the fall, but we talk about it as an individual in the humanity, yeah, how death yeah. entered in. And we know that because death then spread to the all sure, the world. But sure. but it's intimately tied to creation itself. Absolutely. Why is that so significant for us? And what does that mean for us then as we're acting as these ambassadors in the midst of this world, trying to dispense our own well, vocation as, as the redeemed humanity? That, that's absolutely vital. And it's it's interesting that several of Jesus' parables are about farming, um, about sowing seeds or whatever. It's, it's as though being a steward of creation is built into his thinking about the kingdom and that part of the point of the kingdom is he is sowing the seed of the kingdom, as in Isaiah 55, you know, as the rain and the snow come down, and blah, 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 so will my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Jesus is doing new creation and, and, and telling us we've got to join in. And the sowing of the seed is both a metaphor, as in the parable, and metonymy. In other words, our looking after of creation is itself part of the kingdom good news. But then I have, of course, as you'd expect, the line that goes on to, as you said, Romans 8, where the point is that creation is groaning in travel and creation will only be put out of its misery when the humans are finally raised from the dead to be the genuine humans they were supposed to be all along. And at the moment, we are lamenting with the groaning of creation and the spirit is lamenting within us, which is one of the most profound passages in Paul. But the point is that we are grieving the fact that God's creation is not yet as it should be and will be, and that we are living with that tension because we who have the first fruits of the spirit we know where this ought to be going and it seems to me that's one of the places from which you would fund a properly christian um uh, ecology 
uh, a care of creation is that uh, and if somebody says well god's going to set it all right in the end so we don't need to worry now i would say you know wash your mouth out the whole point as with um when we sin it's no good saying well one day god will raise me from the dead and i won't want to sin then paul is very clear though you've already been raised from the dead in christ so you jolly well deal with sin in, in your life right now thank you very much and in the same way if we are already raised with christ then we are in this tension between what we already are and what we will be and if what we will be is the true creation carers and creation restorers as romans 8 then we ought to be getting into practice right now and we ought to be putting up signs of that coming refructifying of creation uh, right now in the present well it, then taking that into consideration and getting back into the political aspect of that and, and playing that out you look over a variety of different expressions of government in this it, it, I'm, i don't know if it's you sure. or it's mike it's writing about it what is our responsibility to speak the truth to power in in civil disobedience specifically or even uncivil disobedience yeah 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 i i mean th there are there are times when some sort of civil disobedience it seems to me uh, i'm not sure about uncivil disobedience but certainly some sorts of civil disobedience are are appropriate and you could say that some of what jesus did was uncivil disobedience when he was feasting with publicans and sinners this was you shouldn't be doing that you know this is going totally against the grain but it was a sign of the kingdom and in a sense the last supper was a sign of the kingdom jesus doing something which was a, a quasi passover meal um but absent from and over against the temple system i mean that that was that was a very very powerful and deliberate um symbol sign sacrament whatever you want to call it but uh, this is a matter obviously for discernment and the church has always had to wrestle with that uh, of discerning the spirits and and of not rushing in um it's so easy to rush in when something has triggered us and we're angry about something oh we're going to do this we're, we're, we're going to be so brave and put out the banner to this or that and the other and then it may be that in a week or two or a month or two we think actually there might have been a wiser way of doing that um and I don't have much experience of, of of doing that kind of thing because I've been very, very fortunate to live most of my life within systems which, though not perfect, are still not um you know the, the the devastating sorts of political systems that some people have to have to live under but I, I ask myself the question you know what would i do if i was living in hong kong right now what would i do if i was um uh, living in taiwan and the chinese came to invade um what should we have been thinking when the russians invaded ukraine and so on and so forth the, these are very difficult questions and uh, i have i've actually asked some wise friends who are leading political theologians about such things and they tend to say yes these are very difficult questions thank you very much um but they they they're real they're on the ground right now so um the 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 question about you know whether civil disobedience is justified romans 13 indicates the general truth that god wants his world to be ordered because order is better than chaos basically even tyranny is is sorry even tyranny is better than anarchy because in anarchy um, the bullies and the bad guys are always going to win uh, with, with with tyranny there, there is a hope that that actually things you may be able to navigate through but um the, the the great western this is one of the really important things which again tom holland brings out the great western push towards what we loosely call liberal, liberal democracy is itself one offshoot of the christian impulse to say we want to find a way which doesn't let people get too uh, high an opinion of themselves into self-idolatry but which doesn't lapse into chaos either and the idea of voting every few years and of doing our best to advise and support and have a loyal opposition etc cetera, etc cetera. this seems to be as good a way of doing stuff as we have yet found and though i'm not saying that the gospel validates the great liberal the great 18th century liberal democratic experiment it certainly has more to support it than the forms of tyranny and anarchy which we've seen sadly disfiguring the planet in recent years there's so much that I would love to parse out on that, but we, we don't have time today. Um, let's talk about Christian nationalism. I, I know okay. that is something that is is in the American, at least in the media perspective, how much it's actually being lived out. That's a debate. So you yeah. don't know if, if the media is taking control of it. But what does Christian nationalism get 
let, let's say let's I hate to say get right. Let's say what it gets right, but I know because there's a whole lot more that gets wrong. Where is there anything that Christian nationalism has that's right within it? That would be hard to say because one of the most fundamental things about Christianity is that it's for everybody. Um, is is that it is precisely for um, the Samaritan who you might have considered an outcast or whoever. Um, it is for the Jew and the Gentile together. It is for male, female, slave, free, etc. So as soon as you say, we're going to have a Christian uh, Gentile thing and keep the Jews out or a Christian Jewish church and keep the Gentiles out, then uh, St. Paul particularly, but actually the whole of the New Testament says, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're missing something absolutely fundamental. This is about being the new humanity. And anything which says this nation has a specific Christian calling. You know, we, we in England used to play this game the whole time. Um, we, we've largely given it up now, which is, I think, a very, very good thing. But um, if you go back a century or so, um, you will find people saying, and meaning it most sincerely, that in our country, we have actually actually Christian civilization, and we have a responsibility to export that to the rest of the world. Unfortunately, we exported a lot of other stuff as well. And it just so happened that it meant that diamonds and gold and other goods came back our way. Oh, what a happy accident that was. So, you know, we've deconstructed all that. And I'm, I'm not one of those who thinks that empire is always wrong. But, but saying that this empire is a Christian empire, I think is always wrong. Because if it was Christian, it wouldn't be the empire of just the people who happen to belong to this country or this this ethnic group or whatever, it would by definition have its doors thrown open to in a broad, wide welcome to anyone, ho, oh, everyone who thirsts come to the waters, says Isaiah. And, and Jesus picks that up in John 7. And, and without that note, which I think Christian nationalism must do without that note, then we're not Christian anymore. And then it just becomes a nationalism which is using Christian language as a way of propping itself up. One of the things that you mentioned in direct correlation to that, or at least I'm going to bring that out, you talk about how when we're to submit to the authorities, that's referring to those who have been elected or appointed or conquered. Meaning that legitimate or illegitimate, there's a submission to those authorities. Am I... Am I stating that correctly? Uh, yeah, it's a way of saying that the, uh, the the Jews of the first century and the Christians in the in the early days, they didn't much bother about whether somebody had been freely and fairly elected, because insofar as people had elections, they had elections in, in, in Rome from time to time, but it really didn't matter. Everybody knew that Caesar was it and the, the petty officials beneath him would come and go. That wasn't the point. The point was God wants his world to be ordered and governed and order and governance is better than anarchy and chaos. Um, therefore, you submit because you want to share God's project, which is of of bringing wise order to the world. Back to Genesis 1, order, uh, creation coming out of chaos. But along with that uh, goes constantly the responsibility of God's people to speak the truth to power. Back to what we were saying half an hour ago, the, the, the John 16 mandate of convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And that's not a matter of waiting for the next election and voting the other way next time. It's a matter of constant. And you see, you see the church doing this in Acts. You see Paul doing it in Acts, where Paul... Um, the Philippian magistrates tell him to get out of town. And he says, um, excuse me, Roman citizen, beaten without trial, um, imprisoned without charge. That's a public apology, by the way. And he gets it because um, they're scared. He knows his rights and he's prepared to tell them when they've been out of line. He does the same with the high priest in Acts 23. Um, you know, and, and this, it seems to me, is a model of uh, the way in which, even though Paul was, was you know, Paul, would, as I've often said, would say boo to every goose and then all the swans as well, um, that the, the, this, this is perhaps not the best way to win friends and influence people. And we don't all have the personality of Paul. But the, the, the model is correct, that the church is not to say, oh, well, we won't vote for you next time then. The church is to say, actually, here is the standard by which you really ought to be behaving. And you're getting this wrong right now. And the church better be careful because it needs to know the ground it's standing on. And there may be a critique coming back as well. So before we launch this exoset into the public domain, let's make sure we've got our own house in order. But that isn't an excuse for hiding away until we're squeaky clean ourselves. We've got to embrace that mandate. Speaking then truth to power, what role does the government have or what is our role when the government outsteps 
its authority into other arenas, specifically in America, talking about gay marriage and abortion. And, but you can also talk about immigrants. You can talk about whatever issue that you have. What is our role then to, after speaking truth to power, the powers that be don't listen? Well, do we submit? Okay. How do we the, respond? The, I mean, it's very interesting looking from the outside at the American situation where you've got the same people wanting to have legislation that allows um, drunken 17-year-olds to own weapons-grade um, uh, guns and the same people who uh, want to prevent um, young women who've been raped having abortions. Um, th there's something very bizarre about that, um, which tells me that actually the desire to, to legislate against abortion at all costs is not actually driven by the same thing that was driving the, the Jews and the early Christians to say that abortion was wrong, because abortion was common in the ancient world. In the pagan world, people would often force their, compel their wives to have abortions, which were very dangerous operations in the ancient world. But that was that was ruled out by the Jews and the Christians, just like they ruled out infanticide. You have a daughter that you don't want, throw her out. The Jews and the Christians didn't do that. Now, um, the fact that the Jews and Christians didn't do that was a witness to the society and the society noticed. Um, now, it, it, the trouble is in America at the moment, as in Britain in other ways, these things have all got bundled up so that if you put a check by this thing on this side of the page, you're going to put a check by all those others because that's what that party stands for. And then you're putting checks the other side um, in contradistinction to that. Most of these issues do not admit of such an easy um, uh, easy categorization. So one of the things the church has to do is to articulate in the public square, by whatever means possible, uh, wiser ways of thinking about the things that have become the so-called hot button issues. Now, I know that's not easy. I was in public life myself for several years as a bishop in the House of Lords and so on, um, saying things which are unpopular in that context. Um, people don't like it naturally. But the church has to be able to do that. And I um, remember speaking up in a debate in the House of Lords about the assisted dying question, the, the um, euthanasia bill. We have to be able to say things to say this is the path of wisdom and that is the path of folly. Um, and then if people don't listen, then we have to find ways of demonstrating um, that actually the, the way we're following is, is the wiser and, and healthier way for the human race. In the book, you talk about these different disparate groups that are all, in some ways, finding their root or their voice within a Judeo-Christian framework. And they are speaking, I mean, they are beneficiaries of that. How do we, how do we mend the division between voices that are so influenced by this idea of rights and justice and all of these different pieces and those on the other side that advocate for evangelism and holiness they're they're not opposing factors but yet we've made them that way yeah yeah we, we've we've made them that way through the outworking of various basically 18th century uh, impulses this is very much enlightenment stuff where where you have um, a split between sacred and secular, between church and, and politics, et cetera, et cetera, um, in a way which certainly didn't come out of the New Testament and, and actually didn't come out of some of the mainline reformers either, because they, they were they were usually very keen on reforming society as well as um, enabling people to find fullness of salvation and so on. So it's a comparatively modern thing. And I think part of the deal is we have to uh, to demonstrate that to people, to show them historically how we got where we got and some bad turns that we made and the bits of the Bible that we missed out in doing so. And then we have to put put the chess pieces back on the board and say, I'm sorry, the whole teaching about Jesus' kingdom message is a vital part of the Bible. And if you skip over it on your way to your reading of Paul as telling you how to go to heaven, then you are missing out a vital part of God's word. Ironically, some of the people who do that claim to be Bible Christians, but then their whole theology is, if you say this prayer, you go to heaven and be careful you don't try to do any good works to earn your passage there as well, or that will nullify it, um, which is such a misreading of Paul. But I've heard that again and again. It's not only a misreading of Paul, it's a skipping over of, of the gospels. And, and how people can justify that, I'm, I'm really not sure. One of the things that you mentioned is having a shared story. 
in as we're going through the world, kind of really parking our theology within the greater biblical framework of the story and its its trajectory and where it's headed. Because we do, we live by a story. You, you've mentioned this in different several different of your writings. Why is it so important to hang this truth and understanding within the greater biblical narrative? As Christians, we are not at liberty to pick and choose in the Bible to say, we want this little strand here, that's going to be our, and no doubt we all begin by having certain biblical strands, which we kind of like and, and understand and go with. But it's rather that the story of Jesus itself embeds itself into the narrative from Genesis to Revelation. In other words, the story of creation and new creation, the story of covenant and new covenant, uh, or renewed covenant or renewed creation. And the way that the Gospels tell the story of Jesus um, has its roots deep in um, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, in the promises of creation and new creation and covenant and new covenant. And it's pointing forwards the whole time to the ultimate new creation of resurrection and, and the new world. And so um, if we're followers of Jesus, and the Jesus that we know is the Jesus we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not some fantasy figure that we've dreamt up somewhere else, the real Jesus, then we are not at liberty to say, well, we'll have Jesus, but we will forget those Old Testament roots. Many people have tried to do that. Or we'll have Jesus, but we'll forget that he was talking about new creation and think that he was talking about souls go to heaven. Thousands of people still believe that, of course. Rather, we need that whole biblical framework. And when we forget it, we lapse back into some kind of philosophy. A Christian Platonism is the popular thing, has been for years, um, which is about the souls going to heaven and so on. Um, and uh, somehow, somehow, those of us who are gripped by the total biblical story, we have to learn how to tell that and how to live it in a way which makes people say, oh, that's curious. I'd never quite seen it like that before. How does that play out with this and that and the other? Those are the golden moments for me as a teacher when I realize that people are glimpsing a bigger picture of the biblical narrative. And no doubt, if I live for another five or 10 or 15 years, please God, I will see bigger and bigger vistas as well, because that's been happening to me all my life. And I hope it's not going to stop now. But talking well, of stopping now, we ought to stop now in a minute, or my wife will not just be rolling her eyes. She'll be hammering on the door. Okay. Well, then I'll ask this uh, one more question here. You mentioned our greatest argument, um, and, and I'm going to read this little quote here you have on 169. Our greatest argument against tyranny, the answer to the critics of liberal democracy, is to point to the monumental achievements of liberal democracy in improving the quality of life and preserving equality under the law for all of its citizens. You, you also mentioned a few pages before that the love of neighbor, and if we're to show a quality of life and a love of neighbor— how do we speak to the love of neighbor when the neighbor is doing something that could, as you mentioned, female circumcision, something that could could actually harm people? How do we do that? How do we go about loving our neighbor to prevent something that they have that freedom in some respect to do? We campaign through um, proper channels uh, to get a law passed or changed. Um, to make it clear that there are certain ways of behaving which are intrinsically dehumanizing, which are intrinsically destructive, which are dangerous, and uh, which are reducing the humanness of human beings. And that that has to be pretty near the heart of it. Um, and uh, if the campaign is not working, then the early Christians would say, we have to live in such a way that the wider society will come to see that the way we're living is the better way to be. I mean, it took the church 300 years before um, the, the, the Roman Empire cottoned on. Um, so many people becoming Christians because they could see that the way these Christians were living was vastly preferable to the way that the, the, the pagan world had ordered itself. But that took time and it took a lot of martyrdom and, and uh, a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, anger and threats and so on. Um, maybe we'll have to go through that again. You know, we've the Enlightenment has bought us time by uh, embracing an Enlightenment-shaped version of Christianity. The Western world uh, doesn't need to be persecuted because who's going to persecute us for believing that one day we'll go to heaven when we die, as long as we just keep ourselves quiet at the moment. Um, but if we were actually to start saying, 
um, we're going to campaign for the rehumanization of our neighborhood, our town, our country, whatever. This might quite soon lead some people in authority to say, we're going to, we're going to ban that. We're going to rule that out. And, and then who knows how soon we could get to that point. Um, I forget who it was. I think it was a, a Roman Catholic Archbishop of Chicago, was it, who said, uh, somebody's quoting this to me the other day, who said to his subordinates, I will probably die at peace in my bed. Um, some of you may well die in a police cell. Some of your successors may well die in front of a firing squad. Um, now, that's perhaps a bit overdramatic, but it could happen. It wouldn't be the first time that there's been a big change and particularly if we give up liberal democracy for all its for all its dangers and, and faults, if we give up liberal democracy and go for some sort of state tyranny instead, then who knows how quickly we would get to that point. Hmm. These are good thoughts, good conversation. One of the things that we do like to leave our people with is because we are Apollos watered, we want to help water faith. So we say we leave them with a water bottle for the week. What is one little water bottle that you can leave for our audience today? I, I would want to go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, and say that we are to be, re the, the, when the Spirit comes, we are to be renewed in knowledge according to the image of the Creator. That's really, really important. So many issues come down to God made humans to reflect his image in the world. The gospel doesn't stop us being genuine image bearing humans, the gospel remakes us into genuine image bearing humans and the gospel says yes to the original creation in saying yes to the new creation and that is at the heart of many of our great puzzles at the moment well tom i want to thank you for coming on the show thank you for the book i recommend everyone go out to get it to, to read it jesus and the powers uh it should be out in just the next week or so and then you can so. get it wherever you get your books but tom thank you for coming on apollo's thank Water. you very much Good talking to you. All the very best. Thank you.